So thank you for joining the Jackrabbit team. And we have Audra Allen here with us again today. Everyone is in listen only mode just to make sure that we all have a great experience. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end. So if you think of any questions while myself or Audra are presenting, you can go ahead and submit those through the Q&A section and we will get to those at the end as many as we possibly can. So just as things come up, you can go ahead and submit those. And anything that wasn't covered in the presentation, we can go through at the Q&A. This meeting is being recorded, so we will send this out to you tomorrow as a follow-up and you can share it with any of your friends, watch it again, um, take some more notes, whatever you like. I just wanna start by introducing myself and Audra. So I'm the client marketing specialist at Jackrabbit. My job is to inform our clients and help them when they need it the most. So getting the information they need out to them at the time that they need it. As a former dance teacher, uh, office staff and dancer myself, um, I really am intrigued by all of the virtual classes that everybody's putting on and how everybody is doing such a great job at adapting to um, what's going on in the world today. So today I'm joined by Audra Allen and she has been in the online classes space for over a year now. So she's got lots of great tips on getting started with virtual classes. That's what she went over last time. And today she's gonna talk about how you can make sure that those classes are more secure. Um, she is in Louisiana and she is available for any help that you need beyond this webinar. So we'll have an option for you to get in contact with her as well. So I will let Audra take over. Are you, oh, wait, sorry, just kidding. Right before Audra takes over, I would like to do a poll. I just wanna get a feel for um, where everyone is in this process. So if you don't mind, if you could answer two questions for me. How many virtual classes are you hosting each week? And who in your studio is managing those virtual classes? Just gonna give it a little bit longer so that everybody has an opportunity to answer. All right, so the numbers are in and it looks like a lot of you are doing quite a few virtual classes with 10 plus per week and a lot of you said it takes a village and or the studio director or admin is um, working on this virtual class project. So lots of people involved. Um, <clears throat> seems like it's more than just a one man or one woman show. So without further ado, now I can pass it on to Audra. Are you ready for us? Yes, I'm turning on my camera now. Awesome. I am going to. Can you? Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here with you guys again this week. If you were able to join in the last webinar, I did speak into how to teach online versus in the studio and how that's different. Um, I want to touch more specifically on making sure your virtual classes are secure because there's been a lot of negative news out there and some unfortunate some negative experiences and i'm going to speak first specifically to using zoom because i know the majority of the dance world has gone to using zoom right now and then i'm going to speak to general safety precautions that applies regardless of what platform you're using i will talk you through what zoom is doing to, and what you can be doing then i'm also going to share my experience with you and show you specific settings and how they work to make sure your classes are secure so i just want to put in a disclaimer I am at home with my two little humans. I'm a single mom. So if they barge in here, that's just part of you know, doing things online live. So they know that I'm supposed to come with us. We'll see how this happens. Um, 
So speaking specifically to Zoom, I personally have been using Zoom for my virtual live dance classes for over a year now. And by choice, because of all the platform options, I found that they were the most successful in letting me have that interaction and that, that feeling of it being similar to being in the studio. Um, I know a lot of people are having to have jumped on the Zoom bandwagon partially out of uh, maybe the stress of just trying to find a quick alternative to not be able to have the studio open right now. And in that process, they're not able to learn all the resources you have in a positive way that Zoom can support you to have a secure setting. Um, I know that there's been this term floating around called Zoom bombing um, that's been happening the last month or so. Uh, I'm going to speak to more about that in a second, but first I'm going to give you some facts. Zoom has been around for over 10 years and specifically designed for business meetings. So they already were set up to be a secure entity for different size businesses, small to massive scale internationally hosting tele teleconferencing and video conferencing. They had 10 million users before this pandemic happened with the virus, and within weeks, they went to 200 million users. So they were doing their part to make sure that things were secure for what they had set up their platform for, and no one saw where we are right now. We all didn't anticipate this. So they did have to play a little bit of catch up to make sure that they were also doing what they could to support, and they have done that, and they are now in a good place with it. But what's happened during those few weeks that everybody hopped online is, unfortunately, not great people in the world started doing this thing called Zoom bombing, which is they were accessing open meetings and they could take over screens and share inappropriate visuals. They could take over chat boxes and put inappropriate comments in there. And it was, there's no rhyme or reason that isn't it a particular type of group, you know, group meeting, they don't know, they just have access to these meetings because people weren't knowing how to secure and make sure that their meetings are locked down and only those who are invited have access. So initially, there was there's settings that were optional that you could have on. If you weren't aware of that, unfortunately, you were left to the mercy of this potentially happening to you. But as of this last Sunday, Zoom actually rolled out mandatory setting changes to secure your meetings. And that's something you cannot have on or off. They're now permanently on. But it does impact what information you need to communicate to your families and also that you are aware of how you're setting up your Zoom meetings if you have not done so yet. So I'm going to talk you through that and um, help you with that process and a few extra things to keep in mind for some extra security options you have. And then I'm going to talk to more of the general idea of what extra things you can do in the virtual world to make sure you're keeping your students, your teachers, your families, everything safe. I'm going to jump over to sharing my screen now. So I can walk you through that. And again, Amber is recording this. You'll be receiving this after. So you will then have the option to go back and see what I'm sharing with you. So you don't have to be like scribbling down notes so drastically. Okay, give me just one second. And okay, so. I have my Zoom account open on the desktop, and this is actually where you need to be able to access all the settings. If you try to adjust these settings in your apps that you've downloaded on your different devices, you're not going to find all of these options. The apps are supplementary to the, the uh, web browser version. So you do want to hop on your web browser and then access them this way. So I logged into my account up here on the right. You can see my image. And to the left, you have profile, meetings, webinars, recording settings. I am in general settings. We're going to talk through these first, and then I'm going to go through and show you, if you were to schedule a meeting, how that looks when you schedule the meeting. Um, so so the, the general settings are, if you have them set this way, that every time you schedule a new meeting, which for us is a dance class, um, this allows it to be a, a preset feature so you don't have to always do all these extra little steps every time you schedule a meeting. So if you have like 50 plus classes you need to schedule, you don't have to keep changing these settings. So the first ones, you know, our general host video, participants video are on. Participant is for us as our students, our dancers. The audio type, I always have computer audio on because that's how they're connecting with us. We're not doing teleconferencing. Join before host. What this means is that if your class, your teacher's class starts at 4 or 15 p.m. and you know they're going to start the class on time, 
there's a way that you can have it to where the students can all join the meeting before the host officially starts it to where they actually can see each other and interact or you can have it to where if this is turned off they actually are just waiting with a blank screen until the teacher starts and then they're all joining in the meeting so i would suggest that if you have and you're comfortable with this and there's an extra step to keep this protected i'll go over that in a second this is a good option for your older dancers, for your company dancers, if they, that gives them a chance. It's like as if they were sitting in the lobby at the studio waiting for class to start. It gives them a chance to connect and talk before the class officially starts and they walked into the studio. Maybe have this off or consider that for your younger dancers so then it's not worry, you know, worrisome, but uh, there's already a security feature in place. So this option is protected either way, how you choose to go, but just so you know what that means. They can see each other and interact before the meeting is started by the host if this is on. So jumping down to uh, require a password when scheduling new meetings. So this has been put into place by Zoom. That you want, this is something that you do want on. That means that every time you schedule a new meeting, that I just want to make sure. Okay, yeah. But every time you schedule a new meeting, a password is put in place. I'll show you when we schedule the meeting, you actually have the option to alter the password. So you can actually have it be things you're in control versus the random generated number. And, um, but this allows that for every class your students join, they have to type a meeting in or the password in. This is helpful. It's speaking back to the Zoom bombing because how people were accessing the classes was that they were just open. Like there was no security put in place. You didn't have to have a password and they could have just typed in random numbers. And there's so many people using Zoom that most likely they were gonna have access to a Zoom meeting code or a meeting ID, but also they've created software that just randomly generates meeting IDs. And they're just like, if it landed on one that's open, they were just joining the class. So this allows that not only, like, so yes, they can see that a meeting is happening, but they can't access it without the password. It already puts that first level of security. Uh, we're about the personal meeting ID. People have been choosing, personal meeting ID is one that's assigned specifically to your account. And I know some studios have been choosing to use your personal meeting ID instead of individual Zoom links for each class, and they're just giving everybody the password to log in when their class starts. Personally, for me, this is, not as secure because if somebody does get access to that personal meeting id everybody in the studio has access to that and if that if that information gets out to the general and gets in the hands of the wrong person people can then access your class and it's just not as secure so if you've been going this route i would encourage you to consider going to the route of each of your classes is scheduled with its own personal meeting id to just add that extra level of security this is a nice feature right here, embed password and meeting link for one click join. What this means is that if you share the link to your families and they have to click on the link to join your class, the password has been encoded in that link so they don't have to type the password in. Or if you choose to share the meeting ID and they actually have to type in the number for the meeting ID, then you do need to share the password number that way. This feature also, um, it is one less step for the family members and it is, it is still secure because the password is there, but if you feel more comfortable that they need to type in the meeting ID separately from the password and then you would share that meeting ID information versus the Zoom link with them. So there's two ways you can share with that based on what you're comfortable with, but both of those forms are secure. New participants upon entry, this is just a nice convenience thing so that when everybody joins your class, you know, they're not, if they're younger, especially, you know, they're screaming in the background or whatever's happening, you don't hear it. So I'm not that's ready to go. Um, I'm now down in meeting basic. In the chat feature, I turn that off. There is no option to chat, which right now I know in our meeting there is the chat box, which is helpful to the setting. But during your technique classes and your dance classes, I strongly encourage that chat box to be turned off for whatever reason your class was not, was accessed, even though it shouldn't be based on all these extra security settings. They can't take over your chat box and post inappropriate content. And then this just allows that extra level of security. Plus your dancers are busy dancing and shouldn't be on their phones or on their devices chatting with each other. Um, I'm just speaking specifically to these, all these safety features, so I'm, I'm bypassing a few of the extra ones you can choose if you want. 
Um, okay, co-host. This allows you, when you are scheduling your meeting, to have, so I'm gonna put in a scenario. So let's say in your studio, you have three physical studio rooms to dance in. So you've chosen to purchase three separate Zoom accounts so you can be running your classes simultaneously if you're keeping a similar schedule. So for Studio A, it has its own Zoom account, Studio B, Studio C, etc. But you still want to have access to each of these classes you've scheduled and then you would put in your email. Having this on allows you to have the email put in so you have access to every one of these classes. So you can always do a virtual check-in to see how your teachers are doing just to be an extra participant in the class. So that is an option you have. Um, that's something you can play with on a personal level. Pers I think it's just a nice extra feature. Um, okay, I'm now jumping down to screen sharing. This is another one for security purposes. So right now you've seen that Emily and I have been screen sharing. And in general, the setting is that anybody can share their screen because that makes sense in meetings. I do have that the screen sharing option is on, but I only have it that the host only can share their screen. This means that none of the students can share their screen. And also that means if anyone were to join the meeting, uh, no, uh, meeting, join the class who we don't want to be there, they can't take over the screen because they don't have access to share it. In the actual meeting itself, if for whatever reason you wanted to see their screen, if they were like showing, pulling up something to share with you, uh, you could give the permission for that individual to do it. But I don't normally haven't had that experience in dance and need to do it. Why I actually have it on during dance class is because there are times I decide I want to pull up a YouTube video to share with my class and I can share my screen. And just like I'm doing now, open up my web browser, pull up YouTube, show a dance video, and we can have a discussion about it. It's a great way to supplement your class online virtually. That allows you to have control of that, but not anyone in addition. Um, you have the option to allow participants to rename themselves, which is helpful, especially if they're older, because if you know they joined on their parents' account and it's just a bunch of numbers or it's their parents' name, this helps you on the teacher side. Then you say, hey, don't forget to change their name, which when they enter the class allows them to show how they're going to be joining. And then you can help a better idea of you know, their names if you, maybe you're doing a master class. Or it's a really large class and a hard time seeing everyone. You can still see their names in the corner. Um, okay, so they have done the additional feature to the waiting room. Well, this was, uh, they've played with this back and forth. So the waiting room is an additional step. And this is putting everybody in a virtual lobby. And the only way that they can enter your dance class is if you come out and um, you individually one at a time accept them into your dance class. So it is an extra level of precaution. So for some odd reason, they hacked with the password, which hasn't been a thing yet. The password has been very helpful in keeping classes secure. Then you can still see, I don't know who this participant is, and you don't accept them into your meeting. So it is another level. If you do have large classes, this is a lot of extra work. Also, if students are running late, you do keep getting interrupted and needing to go back to this, your device and adding them in. So that is something to consider. But again, what you're most comfortable with. Show a join from your browser link is just a nice extra feature for those families that maybe didn't download the app on their device. Um, this allows that the link will allow you to join the meeting without having to have the app downloaded and it will go through the web browser. So it's just a convenient feature to let them have two separate ways to work to access your class. Uh, the rest are uh, email notifications. So those are the basic settings for security. And there's one more feature I want to speak to you on. And I'm not able to show it to you because it, it's actually in Zoom. But I will talk you through it. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Hi, I'm sitting down in my, my dance space. <laughs> so there is the option at the bottom of your screen. Um, I always select the wrong one. Oh, when you hit participants when you're hosting and you select participants, it pops up the screen and it lists every person that's participating in your meeting or your class. Like right now I can see the panelists on one side and all the attendees of your dance classes or your, your students, sorry. There are three buttons along the bottom. There's mute all, unmute all, which is a great feature to have for your classes. And then there's a more button, and it's a drop down button. 
you select that and there's multiple extra features there you can choose to bring new participants upon entry allow participants to unmute themselves so if you have a bunch of little kids who have learned that they can unmute themselves you can actually uncheck this so they have no control over unmuting themselves you get to mute them and unmute them which is great for younger kids in class there is a lock meeting feature and that is the one I'm speaking to that you need to start making this a habit every class. So what this does, it's like locking your front door once you get in your home. Um, this, once this is selected, no one else can enter your class. So what I strongly encourage is that for you, for your studios, for your teachers, if you're independently teaching, five minutes after class starts, you lock it. So if a people, few people are running late, then they still have access to class. But if someone's running more than five minutes late, unfortunately, you know, they didn't make it in time, but you are able to make sure your class is secure. This is not a setting you can do outside of the actual meeting itself. This is something you have to do each time you're running a class. So when you do this, this is like you can put a sticky note on your device. You can have a little alarm on your smartphone or smartwatch, you know, anything like that. Whatever you need to be reminded that at five minutes you go in, you hit participants, you hit the more button that offers the drop down and you hit lock class or lock meeting. And then no one else, people can exit, but no one can re-enter. So that is the last final step to making sure that your Zoom meeting is secure. And um, so we talked to specifically to Zoom that you want to, you need to decide if you're gonna allow your, your dancers be able to see each other before class or not. There's gonna be a password in place and I'll go back and show you the meeting itself or the schedule in the meeting itself. And then also you um, will turn off the screen sharing, turn off the chat feature and then making sure that you are locking your meeting when it's done. So let me reshare my screen. So when scheduling the meeting, you could, you can do from selecting meetings on the side or schedule a meeting at the top. And again, meeting is for us dance class. So when you schedule a new meeting, you've already preset what you can on the settings just to make it more convenient. You type in the class, the teacher's name, the, the class it is, the level, the day and time. You know, you schedule when it's happening. You can type in if the class is happening on the quarter instead of the half hour. You can type in the, the actual time. You just have to hit enter to keep it in place. You select the time zone. And this is the great feature of the recurring meeting. This allows it to, if you have it multiple times, you know, if it runs every week, if it runs a few, you know, two times a week, you can select all that, how many you want to run. Registration is still an extra feature that I believe has to do with each person. Each people, each person who's joining the class would have to create an account, which is an extra step I don't think is necessary for the families and it doesn't necessarily do an extra level of security. So I would just take that off the table. I don't, I don't have my dancers register. This is where the meeting is automatically generated. I know some studios have chosen to have one password for the whole entire studio, even though there's different meeting IDs. Some people are doing that extra level to where there's a different meeting ID or a different password for every class. So whatever you feel most comfortable with, I think that if you are only sharing with those who are in that class the Zoom meeting ID or the Zoom link, then it's okay to have a studio-wide password. But if you are extending all of the class information to the whole studio, I think that also having a general password is going to keep it not as secure. So just play around with what you feel most comfortable, but having the password on is definitely a, you know, an extra level of security. And if you have that one setting check we talked about before, it allows them to join via the Zoom link without having to type in a password. It's still there, it's still activated. It's just not something that to type in unless you have them type in the meeting ID. And then just speaking to the last little bit, again, and join, enable join before host, that was selected automatically on because that's a setting I had on in my general settings, mute participants upon entry. Enable waiting room is where you then need to individually accept them into your class. Only authenticated users can join to speak to them having, a, having, um, having an account. So that is an extra step for your families I don't necessarily think is pertinent for them. And then you can choose to record the meeting automatically. The alternative host, this is where you put the co-host in. If you only have a free account with Zoom, you do not have the option for co-hosts. So you do need to have one of the purchased monthly memberships, like the $15 a month and you're considered licensed is how they term it. You'll see that next to your name and your profile will say licensed next to it. And that means you are purchasing their, 
their platform. And then that allows you to have the feature of the co-host. And then you would hit save. And it shows up as this. All the information you put in is there. The meeting ID is there. The required meeting and the password that you chose. You can go back and edit and change this if you forgot. The URL is now available. You can copy and paste that on whatever platform you share with them. You can copy the invitation and email this out, which I think this is not the most prettiest format to be sharing on my, on my personal opinion. So it's however you choose to share that information with your families. And you just see how all of a sudden you selected are ready to go. Um, so those are specifically speaking to Zoom. And before I jump into the general platform, can you open it up to any questions, if there are any questions, Amber, for Zoom, so I'm not backtracking to this? Absolutely. Um, so first question, if I created ongoing meetings and changed the settings, do I need to delete my current meetings and create new ones with these settings, or will the ongoing meetings automatically go forward with these new settings? So are we talking about one that they had already previously scheduled? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it is that you don't have to schedule all new ones. Zoom was nice about that. So if it is that you choose to implement the password and you don't have that the Zoom link will include the password, you are going to need to reshare the information. But if you just update it and it's all there, you have, shouldn't have any problem with it just being good to go. So if you're adding the password, just share. You would just need to say, if you're going to have them log in with the password, you just need to share the passwords, but the links are still valid. You don't have to go and reschedule 50 new classes. Awesome. All right, next question. How is the meeting any more secure if the password is embedded in the link? So that has to do with how you choose to share your password, which is I'm going to speak to general security, regardless of what platform you're using. So if you're only sharing the link with specific people and it's not just like I'm going to copy and paste it in a free for all private Facebook group for the studio, then it's based on how you choose to share it. So I, under, I, I personally agree and think that if you are doing like general emails out to everybody, then yes, it's easier to share that link and it is not as secure. It's, to, it's intended to be a more still to offer a level of convenience that Zoom is trying to do. The more secure option is sending out meeting IDs and passwords. That is the more secure option. So if you're able to find that you're just sharing the link with those dancers specifically for your class, that is still helpful. It does keep a level of security, but the more secure option is having them type in the meeting ID and password. One is just a little bit more convenient. Absolutely. Uh, next one, if mute participants upon entry is on, doesn't this prevent them from interacting before instructor enters? Yes. And then if you have it set in the class or in the settings for the meeting, to where they can unmute themselves and they can unmute themselves and talk. So as long as you have that feature, they can read talk. And it's just, it's just how you choose to do it. So if you don't want them to talk with each other, if you don't want them to see each other beforehand, then that's the setting you have in place. If you're gonna let them talk with each other beforehand, then you can just have that setting automatically off. I need to pause for a second. My door is being knocked at a human. <laughs> no problem. Just a second. <laughs> And this is the fun of live teaching, right? So while I have um, Audra uh, on mute right now, there is a question about Jackrabbit. So I wanna go ahead and answer that one. Um, so the question is, I tried copying URL last night into the Jackrabbit email link. It also copied in the password slash pin. What did I do wrong? Where does the pin slash password go if I choose the extra level, including the generated auto? So I wanna make sure that I fully address this. So if I don't, if you'll just um, send in a follow-up question after. But in Jackrabbit, I would encourage you to use the virtual class link that is actually on the class page um, at the bottom of the summary tab. And the reason for that being um, if you put the link there, that will show up in the parent portal and then you're not emailing the link and the password because in the day of technology, if someone intercepts emails, then they have the link and the password. Um, so the great thing about Jackrabbit is it is creating another level of security where you can put the virtual link on the class, which shows in the parent portal, and then you can send the password through email 
and then what good is the password if they don't have the link? So um, I'm not sure who asked that question, but just send in a follow-up if I didn't quite get that all, of the, all the way answered for you. And I, got, I have another one about Jackrabbit, so I'll take that one. Um, I see in Jackrabbit that you can include the Zoom link in the class information settings. Will this give students access to the Zoom link once they register? Can we add the password here or do you use the link with password embedded in the link? Um, great question. So since you wouldn't be emailing this out, this would be something that would show up on the parent portal side. You could definitely use the link with the password embedded. Um, like I said, you wouldn't be sending that out to everyone for it to be intercepted in email. Um, and then they would only need to register if you have it set up that they need to register for it. So you can still require a password, I believe, and Audra, correct me if I'm wrong, you can still require a password without requiring them to register. So. Correct. Okay. That's what I thought. And Okay, um, a follow-up question to the other Jackrabbit one where you were trying to copy in the virtual class link. It said something about must be copied, correct URL. I do know that you need to have the full URL. So um, instead of starting with www, it needs to start with HTTP or HTTPS. Um, that one may need supports help. So if you can chat into them or send in a ticket and they will be able to further troubleshoot that for you because I wanna make sure we get you set up for success there. And thank you for sending in a follow-up on that. So I've got about eight more that have come up and they're all, they all seem to be related to Zoom. So you, you good to keep going? Good. Okay. okay. From Jordan, can you show us what a sample class looks like? What does that mean? Now, Jordan, if you could um, expand, on. <laughs> expand on that a little bit, are you just wanting to see the Zoom? like setup aspect of that, um, let us know and we can come back to that. Um, from Robin, you mentioned a previous seminar, when and what is that one? Um, you wanna go for it, Audra? Um, I talked specifically um, to the differences of teaching online, which there are many, versus in the studio and what that looks like just to more quickly prepare you for the transition virtually. And I spoke to different ways you can share with your families. I spoke to different ideas of teaching younger kids versus older kids, benefits of using Zoom to help you with a live interaction or decide if you need to do pre-recorded or live classes. Multiple things we covered. And I know that they recorded that as well. And I believe, Amber, you guys have a way of sharing that. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we will follow up with this information. And if you um, would like the recording from the other one, we have that and we can absolutely share that as well. All right, let's see. Um, from Robin, if you want to set up $15 a month for the multiple accounts for teachers, can I do it and then send the IDs to the teachers and do they need to download the Zoom app or can they join through Facebook? Okay. So, yes, and this is the main way I've been having studio owners set up their accounts as we've tried different options and the people I'm coaching, this is what's been most successful. So if you have multiple studio owners, like we talked about, you want one Zoom account for each, you would, I would suggest you create a new Gmail account that's like the name of the studio room. And so that's why it's a universal email because you're going to share the email and the password to get into the Zoom account with each of your teachers. So you want to make sure that it's not a personal one and that way the teacher's personal emails aren't being used and you're just able to use these new generic ones that you've attached. So maybe it says like studio A and then the name of your studio at gmail.com. And then that way they have access to it. It is suggested that you have the apps downloaded on your devices just because it's very convenient to work that way and that Zoom was set up to be working through the apps. But if they don't, it's not the end of the world it just is working from their web browser instead they can access their classes via the app or the web browser to, to start the classes okay great um, if the class is locked after the class starts i assume the alternative host can still enter um, from what i understand is yes i have not heard anybody having any issues with that since that option has been put in place 
possible. Is there a possibility for us to get a second link option from the summary page? I will take that one. <laughs> um, so as of right now, they are not adding extra link fields to the summary um, tab on the class page. However, um, if you are needing extra links added to your classes, you can use the resource management um, option. The resources tab is on the class page as well. Um, it does not have to be files. It can be URLs as well. And then you would just make sure that that is published to the parent portal. So the resources tab kind of has a twofold purpose um, that you can attach files and also you can add links. Um, if, you if you publish to the parent portal, then underneath your class, your virtual class link, it will say view resources and that's what they would be able to access those additional links. So hopefully that helps. And this one is just um, a comment. They can also put the Zoom link with the password embedded in the link, and then they won't need a password at all. That's what we're doing, and it's working great. In the class, in the description, we click, we write, my goodness, click here to enter virtual class so the parents are very easily directed. So great tip. Yeah, and then speaking to that, I mean, because you guys are already using the secured platform of Jackrabbit, you're already not sharing you know, they're, they're, you're not emailing the individual links to other people. So having it so password secured already, and then it's only you have to access it via Jackrabbit signing in that way, then it's already an extra level of security too. Yes, absolutely. So this is a follow-up one. Um, and I think this one's going to be more for me. So do you still need to send the password separately via email if you put the link in the class summary area or could we add the password in the class ID spot? Great question, Laura. Unfortunately, the class ID field that's on the class summary page does not translate over to the parent portal. Um, so I have also seen people, um, so you put the URL in the link field and then the text that you can put in, um, which is what shows up on their side for them to click on. I've seen them say, click here and use password five, six, seven, eight um, as the text so that they click and they saw the password and put it in there. So that's another option if you wanted to avoid email altogether. Um, so from Melissa, wondering if you will cover how breakout rooms work. Okay, so breakout rooms is a feature you can have during your class that if you decide, let's say you're doing a choreography class. I personally have not gone this route, but I know what it is, so I'm gonna hopefully help you guide with this. <laughs> guide you through this. So when you're hosting your meeting and you have this option to do breakout classes, you can actually assign certain participants into that. So let's say you're doing a choreography class and you decide to have them break up into groups of three and work on a little choreography section virtually, like come up with an eight count together. You can actually have them go into those little mini meetings during your actual meeting so they're not all talking over each other and they're just talking with each other and then you can bring them back. I personally have not had a chance to play with it, but I know I have talked with others who have used it and found it successful for those settings. Hopefully that helped. Yeah. <laughs> um, from Diane, Audra, tell again why we wouldn't want to just copy the invite and email it, the format or info in the format. That's just a personal aesthetic thing for me. I just thought it looks really clunky. You're more than welcome to. All the information is there. I just like that I'm able to then share the link in my, my own format with any additional information I wanted to share in that email versus just that email going out like it is. So you can set up for that. Yeah. Um, so I have a couple of people asking for the recording from the last one. So I'm going to send you the link via chat. I think that will work. Um, but if not, obviously you can reach out to us or you can search for it on YouTube. It was called Dancing Through Anything. Um, will there be a way to add a description to the resources? Mary, that is a great question. Um, I am not sure about that, but if that is something that you are looking for from our Jackrabbit team, I really encourage you to use the idea portal. Now more than ever, our product team is really checking the idea portal to see how they can refine what they put out. Um, the resources management enhancement was supposed to come out much later, but they fast-tracked it um, 
to help everybody during this time. So it will need some fine tuning and that's a great um, suggestion. So make sure you put that in the idea portal, please. Another one, if you have your meeting set up per studio and you lock the meeting when the first class starts, can you unlock so the next class can access the class at their class time? So I think what, what I'm hearing the question being asked is that you know, you're using the personal meeting ID for the entirety of your schedule. So instead of having being a separate Zoom event, the meeting for each class, the question would apply to if you were using your personal meeting ID, you would then need to unlock it to let the next one start. If you are hosting individual meetings and it's set up on one account, the unlocking and locking only applies to that one meeting. It doesn't roll over to the next meeting. All right. Um, this one also looks like a comment slash tip and trick. Um, the customer can't actually see the link. They only see the wording click here to enter virtual class. So this is going back to the Jackrabbit aspect where you can enter a link and then text that is viewable which is great when you're doing recurring classes. So if a student drops, they no longer have access to the link and can no longer enter the class. Whereas if you emailed a recurring link to your customers, they can continue to use the link because they can see, copy and paste it. Very well, good point. And let me, let me speak to that too really fast. So really easy way to work with that is if you only set up per month, if you, if you charge tuition monthly, that you actually only schedule a month's worth of classes to be reoccurring. So when it's time for the next month, you actually would say once tuition is received, you will receive the next month Zoom week if you're choosing to go that route versus using Jackrabbit. So that's another way to work with that. Yeah, absolutely. Another one about locking the class. If you lock your class but have your waiting room enabled, can people still enter the waiting room or will that be locked as well? I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> I've not seen anything pertaining to that. So the waiting room and the locked feature are two separate security levels. So in my mind, and I don't know if this is fact or not, they do not pertain to both, but I don't know. I haven't seen any type of anything to speak to that. Now I want to look into that. I'm curious. <laughs> awesome. Um, so this is a Jackrabbit question. Difference between video link URL and video link text. That's a great question. So the video link URL, for example, would be your Zoom meeting um, that has HTTP colon slash slash www, all that good stuff with the meeting ID in it. And then your video link text will be what you want the parents to see instead of that long um, link. So whether you want them want it to say click here to access a virtual class or the name of the class, um, that is just kind of pointing them to the class without showing the nasty, not so fun URL. So hopefully that. Uh, next question, would recurring classes have the same ID and password each week? Also, what if these recurring classes take place every other week rather than every week? So yes, the, the recurring class, it's the same meeting ID and password, which is what's nicely convenient about it versus having to schedule new ones every week. In the recurring, let me show you actually. And when you are scheduling your meeting and you choose, you put in your information, you hit recurring meeting, you can select weekly and then it lets you choose how often and you can put it every two weeks. So that should then help you with it if it meets every other week. Hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> All right, next one from Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. A little special shout out. Um, does it matter if the teachers are using the Zoom account to teach their meetings if I go on at the same time in the same account to create more meetings? Um, I can't speak to that personally. Um, I want to say that you can. I'm in, I'm, I'm, um, I'm in a meeting with you guys right now and. I'm on my account scheduling stuff. So yes. Yeah. 
because <laughs> um, we share our login uh, across teams here. And so someone else could be using this one right now. Um, and I know that incidental, like accidentally I've been in when someone else was on a webinar. So I'm pretty sure you can. And you just can't live, you just can't host your classes simultaneously in the same account, which is why you create a different account for each studio if you have mm -hmm. classes on at the same time. That's the only thing that doesn't work. Yep. All right. This one I think is shooting back to me. Um, I think this has been answered, but is it correct you can add two videos in the summary sections because there are two different bars? Almost. Um, so in the summary tab, you can add one link with whatever text you want to show up. If you are needing to add more links, um, you can use the resources tab because you can upload files or add links and then publish to the parent portal. Um, so if you are stuck on that, reach out to support and they can help you navigate that and get all of your links available. All right, I think this one's going back to you. Um, we post a link to Band app from Jackrabbit and have each of our classes set up in Band. It's free. Band is our virtual studio space. All content is shared from Band, pre-recorded classes, live meeting, info, and other content. And if someone doesn't pay their fees, they get removed from Band and have no further access as Band has a unique invite ID that you generate and send. It has worked well for us and just wanted to share. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that is a fantastic suggestion. Thank you. So yes, Band app is a great supplemental resource for teaching live. So if you're choosing to do live and you use Zoom, Band is still a great way to communicate with your families in a secure setting. Like I said, it's free. And um, you do have the option to stream live in Band, but it's not a two-way option like Zoom. It, the students can see you, but you can't see the students. Um, the one hurdle with Band app is you have to have every family create an account, their own account with Band in order to have access. But if, once you get over that hurdle, it's a great free resource to supplement. Great point. Um, next one, after the first month trial, can you set up another free trial? Uh, most likely with a different email, if you're gonna, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you probably have to use a different email. So you'd have to then go through and reschedule everything and do all of that too. Mm -hmm. From David, we've had the experience of someone logging into an account to schedule and accidentally bumping the class in progress on the same account. Um, so going back to Cheryl's question, just something to be aware of. If you can, I would just maybe set up a test class and, mm -hmm. you know, obviously not do the actual live event and just test it out and see what happens just to make sure. Okay. Um, from Candy, good day, ladies. I'm one of two leads within our gym's mission to learn all we can very quickly. I have watched the previous presentation on YouTube. Thank you, Audra. However, I would love if you could email it to me as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Candy, I am writing your name down and I will make sure I send that to you as well. And Candy and everyone here, like I am, I know I was gonna do this at the end, but I am, I have been doing strategy calls and coaching sessions and faculty training and staff training and all the things and follow-ups, make sure everything's in place. So I've helped people very quickly learn what you need to, to make sure what's successful for your studio and what makes sense for your family. So if you, the information will be available to you to reach out to me afterwards, I'll be more than happy to help you continue to learn as quickly as you need to. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, what is the best way to set up Zoom with multiple instructors teaching classes at the same time? Is this possible? Also looking for the most cost-effective option? Yes, um, I don't, um, yes. So that speaks to what I said earlier. If you have multiple studio rooms, you need to get an account for each studio. And then you schedule all the classes that would happen in Studio A are scheduled in students, the Studio A account, and same for B and C. And that way teachers are simultaneously teaching, but they're logged into different accounts teaching their class. The most cost-effective way to do that is each of those accounts is $15 a month. They do run monthly, you can cancel at any time. So it would be a $45 commitment if you have three studios you need to work with per month. So that does allow you to continue having those classes run simultaneously. All right. I think this one is just um, adding some commentary. It has been so much easier to have the link in Jackrabbit. It saves hours of prep getting parents into another app. 
We use band as well, but it's just as a gathering place to stay connected. It's optional and open to all of our customers. It includes fun stuff, free stuff, and live stuff. But for the customers who are continuing to pay, thank goodness for Jackrabbit because adding the space for the link to be attached to the class saves hours of organization time and the customers already have Jackrabbit accounts. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we have found difficulty teaching tap through Zoom with a group. The sounds of the different dancers seem to cause disruptions to each other. Has anyone found success with teaching a tap group with all dancers tapping together? Okay, so yes, this is, I'm gonna put a disclaimer in my experience that tap and acro are the two ones that do not easily transfer to the virtual setting successfully. I think acro is even more hard. So my experience when I teach tap online, all of my dancers are muted. That way they only hear me. So that way it's not muffled for them across each other and they're focusing on my sound. That means I'm not able to hear them in general. But when I do want to break down individually, I go to each of their screens and I mute them and I let them run or do it. And then they can still, the other tap dancers, because they're still muted, can continue to practice or even tap with that student, but I'm only hearing one at a time to clarify any sounds that are happening. I also very rarely tap to music when teaching online because that does cause that extra lag in there. And I've found that it's just been easier to do less music versus more. There are a few setting options you can play with within Zoom, but it also depends on the device you have, your speaker setup, if you're in a studio versus in your home. There's a few things that you just have to generally modify that work specifically for you. But tap, yes, there are a few things that go off the table. Having everybody hear each other is not successful with tapping online. All right, and last one. Do you have any best practices regarding recording classes relative to security slash privacy? Okay, so I know some insurance companies are requiring that you record every class for liability purposes. So that's just something to double check first. Um, and then second, if you are sharing these recordings with your classes and needs to be in a secure place, and in, I had spoke to this in another webinar that you need to consider doing a, a new waiver or a, like a family contract before they move to the virtual setting that they understand that these video links, any recordings, anything like that is not to be shared outside of where they access it. And then if like if something disciplinary, like the consequence if they're found, it's for grounds for immediate dismissal with no refund because the privacy of the students and the teachers is at stake. So it, it's again, it's, how you, it's where you choose to securely share that. Like band is a great option for that. If you wanna do um, a private Facebook group, there is issues sometimes with the copyright with sound. And so if you do like a private YouTube or private Facebook, a lot of times they'll mute a lot of your videos because of the copyright for music. So just keep it in mind where you're sharing it, who you're sharing it with, and then also strongly encourage having a waiver in place that your families have to sign. Awesome. Did you wanna jump back into other content? Um, I actually have the chat box open too. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, if I just, I mean, cause I feel like there's a few more that are relevant here too really sure. quick. Okay. Um, Robin said, how do you share classes with students that miss class? So that then speaks again how you choose to share your content. If you individually send a link of the recording to them, because um, when you choose recording, you either can choose to have it in the Zoom cloud or straight to your device. If you send it to the Zoom cloud, it's extra work just to download it to your device anyway. So I just recommend choosing straight to your device. And then it turns it into not a very large video file that you can then do whatever you need with as if you had any other video file. So you can send in, you can you can individually email that video to that student who missed class. You can have it set up to where if you're using Google Docs or um, Band and you have like a folder for each class, you can put it in that class if you want to choose to share it that way. So there's a few different ways you can choose how you want to structure if it's only for that student or if you're letting the whole class have access to recordings to do follow up work. Lisa said, can you provide the legalized wording for using online classes? Um, in regards to what I would definitely use remote. So when, when you are creating anything, if you are going to create a waiver, you know, and speak to adding any of that, you would you would use the terms remote training. So in addition to face to face, so that way it's clear that you're covering both areas. 
but you know, re remote virtual training. So it's just clear what it is. Does that help Robin? If you need more, please let me know. <laughs> And then I'm, I'm reading through, um, I don't know, Amber, if you want to take over, I don't know. Sure. Um, our next one, I just realized I was anonymous and being so chatty with all the suggestions. We love them, so no sweat there. I just wanted to throw out that you can also pay for the business version of Zoom and invite alternate hosts to your studio account. We have 16 teachers who are alternate hosts to your studio account. Once you sign up for the business version, you invite them to link their personal account to yours, and then they log in and start their classes from their own Zoom accounts. As the master host, we are able to still view all classes on our meeting page and enter and exit classes at any time. Also, the studio is the automatic co-host to all classes because the studio created all of the classes and then invited the alternative host co-host. This is the easiest way, but it also costs money. I hope this makes sense. Thank you so much. And I want to add, sorry. No, you're good. I want to add to that. So if you are having the, so if you go that route, you need to have the teachers create a pref professional email. You do not want them using their personal emails just so there's that, there's not that gray area. So personal and business are separated. So if you want to create an email via Gmail, a free one, right? The teacher's name, the studio name, however you want to do that at Gmail for each teacher. So that way there's not any gray area crossover. All right. And okay. Another one from Robin, how do you share classes with students that miss class? Um, I answer that one. Okay. And then um, David said, uh, using record to cloud is much less work. Having done both, just share the link and you're done. You can let it expire after a week so that it doesn't linger. Yes. I do want to let you know, David, that one of the things that's been happening with Zoom Cloud is they've had some issues with some security. And people have been having access to video, but that's just a very recent thing, and they're looking into getting that taken care of very quickly. So I'm sure that'll be adjusted, but just something to keep aware of on your side. I can't speak to more than that. That's all I know based on what I just said. But there's been a little bit of security breach with video access on Zoom Cloud. And just to add to that, I know on our side when we record to the cloud, sometimes there's a little bit of a delay, more so than normal, just because the amount of people using the cloud. So if it's something you want access to sooner, you're probably better off um, recording to your computer. But it is a great option. It's nice that you have both options to make what, what, what makes sense to you. Um, yeah, I do have a few other things to cover just really quick. Just some general security tips when you go to the virtual setting. You just need to make sure that, which I know you're already thinking this, but your priority is not only your student safety, but also your teacher's safety. Both are vulnerable in this setting. So again, it's speaking to how you share the recordings, just making sure the classes are locked. Any platform that you use, maybe you're not using Zoom, maybe you've looked into using Google Hangouts or something, just double check all the security options you have with those platforms and make sure you're implementing it as secure as you can for your classes. That makes sense for you. And then how you share them, where those, where those links are going. If, you know, how you're, if you're sharing to everybody, but only certain people needed that information, why are you sharing to everybody? So just keep in mind what, what, extra, what extra levels you can add to keep the security in place. And then the biggest one is transparency with your families. I know that the families are seeing things in the news like why we're we using this platform. I'm seeing all the Zoom bombing or what, like, how are you securing my child's safety? Speak to your families, send out a letter included in the packet you have with them. These are the steps. These are exactly all the things we're doing. We're training our faculty. We've done training, like we've taken all these extra setting precautions. This is what's happening in each class. This is how we're sharing recordings or we're not recording or just all those things in place so the families have that extra level of security and that they know on their side and the teachers too know on their side how their, their safety is being taken care of. Awesome, great suggestions. Um, I'm going to share my screen if I can. There we go. Um, just want to talk about some resources. Um, as Audra mentioned, she is a resource. So if you want to get connected with her, we highly encourage you to do so. We will send out some information for you to let us know that you want to connect with Audra um, in your follow-up with the recording, so please don't be shy. 
Um, follow our company Facebook page. If you're a Jackrabbit client, join our Facebook users group. It is a closed group for our users, and I have never seen the community come together as well as I have um, during these last few weeks. Um, it's really inspiring, and I love what everyone is doing. Um, here at Jackrabbit, we also have a COVID-19 resource center. So that is there with updated information by the hour, pretty much, um, as well as we can. So lots of good stuff there. And then follow us on the blog. Um, we have put out some tips that Audra shared with us last time on our blog, and we're constantly providing content that's going to help you weather the storm. So be sure to check that out. And before we let you go, Miss Emily is on the line, and she's going to speak to what else we have coming up next. Hey gang, thanks for hanging out with us today and sticking around for the Q&A. And thank you, Audra, you have just been, you know, a silver lining amidst all of this. So thank you for partnering with us. Amber, as always, you are such an awesome presenter. Um, our next event, we are partnering with our longtime friend, Shasta Hamilton. She is the owner and founder of Stage Door Productions and has written a ton of blog content for not only us, but your friends at Tutu Ticks. Um, I think we have all come to terms with the fact that a few weeks ago, we thought we were just going to resume in a couple of weeks, business is normal. And the new reality is, is new beginnings are inevitable for all of us, even us here at Jackrabbit. At the end of this, when this lifts, we have a ton of new beginnings and new opportunities. So Shasta is going to work with you for the next three Thursdays in a row on a series called Coffee and Creativity. The first one is Gratitude Over Grump. So she wants to get you in the mindset of thinking about strategic, long-term opportunities that you have with an event like this, because those of us who take action right now, who accept where we're at and take action and put some things into place are going to be the studio owners and the businesses that come out on top and really thrive in all of this. So we're going to meet together on Thursday. If you already follow Tutu Ticks or Jackrabbit on Facebook, you can uh, register for the webinar. You'll also get a link in our follow-up email here today, so you can register for that tomorrow. And then in a segment called After Brews, Shasta is going to be live on the Jackrabbit Facebook page um, for Q&A at 1130 Eastern time on Friday morning. So go ahead and join us there. You'll get the little alert if you already like us that we're going live, but she's going to answer some live Q&A about how you can take this opportunity, this really unusual season, and think about it in a strategic and long-term long way so that you are a studio who comes out on top. So we're excited. We hope you join us. Hey, Amber. Yeah. Um, there was one more comment that was just posted, and I want to res respond to that because it's kind of cool. Um, there was someone, so we had spoken earlier to the legalize, my kids are yelling, so just make sure that's <laughs> all good. Um, someone just shared, like, a, the option to copy and paste this legal jargon, and mm -hmm. I should be discouraged from that because it's actually a copyright infringement. Anytime that you just copy and paste any legal jargon like this, it's specifically for an organization, they probably have already hired lawyers to do that, and you're now copywriting on that lawyer's work, and you can actually get sued. So, like, I have legal jargon I use, but I hired a lawyer for it, and I had a, had a sign-in contract that I wouldn't share that. So there's general stuff you can find, but I wouldn't take something like this verbatim, because that is copyright infringement. Just keep that in mind. Great tip. All right. Well, it looks like that is it. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, lots of great information shared from Audra, and we will send this recording out. Uh, tomorrow afternoon. So be on the lookout for that and let us know if you have any questions. Connect with Audra, connect with us. We are here for you and keep doing great work. Thanks you guys. I loved working with you today. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you.